A Stolen Legacy. Introduction. Characteristics of Greek Philosophy. The term Greek philosophy, to begin with, is a misnomer, for there is no such philosophy in existence. The ancient Egyptians had developed a very complex religious system called the Mysteries, which was also the first system of salvation. As such, it regarded the human body as a prison house of the soul, which could be liberated from its bodily impediments through the disciples of the arts and sciences. I think that was a typo, though. I think they meant through the disciplines of the arts and sciences and advanced from the level of a mortal to that of a god. This was the notion of the summon bonum, or greatest good, to which all men must aspire. And it also became the basis of all ethical concepts. The Egyptian mystery was also a secret order, and membership was gained by initiation and a pledge to secrecy. The teaching was graded and delivered orally to the neophyte, or the student. And under these circumstances of secrecy, the Egyptians developed secret systems of writing and teaching and forbade their initiates from writing what they had learned. After nearly 5,000 years of prohibition against the Greeks, they were permitted to enter Egypt for the purpose of their education. First through the Persian invasion and secondly through the invasion of Alexander the Great. Don't ever call him the Great ever. From the 6th century BC, therefore, to the death of Aristotle, the Greeks made the best of their chance to learn all they could about Egyptian culture. Most students received instructions directly from the Egyptian priests. But after the invasion by Alexander the Great, the royal temples and libraries were plundered and pillaged, and Aristotle's school converted the library at Alexandria into a research center. There is no wonder then that the production of the unusually large number of books ascribed to Aristotle has proved a physical impossibility for any single man within a lifetime. Well, that's George G.M. James's take on how the Greeks got into our ancient ancestors' civilization and learned. However, I want you to know that there are other teachers like George G.M. James who have slightly different versions to the story. One of the most important things that I think I need to say to you is that you have to learn how to think for yourselves, how to intuit for yourselves, and how to see things for yourselves. There's a brother named Bobby Hemet who said that in a spiritual kind of thought that he had, the ancestors told him that no Egyptian priest ever taught a Greek that, you know, through their pillage and plunder, that's how they took knowledge that was available and, and manipulated it into who they are now. In his book, The Iceman Inheritance, the Canadian writer, Michael Bradley, has made the most glaring admission about the Europeans' attempt to dominate the world through racism. There are a large number of books on this subject, but the writers tend to hedge on the subject by inferring that in spite of the atrocities and the racism brought to this world by the Caucasian race, they have given the world some order, some technology and arts and letters of lasting benefit. What the authors of these books do not take into consideration is that in spite of the contributions that benefit the world, the Europeans in their attempt at world domination created a disastrous climate for the world's people. Caucasians, in general, have an inferiority complex about their world position. If they were secure within their alleged superiority, they would not have to shout it to the world so often and so loudly. When a people feel called upon to repeatedly announce their superiority to the world, it is suspected that behind all their pretense, they do not believe it as much as they want other people to believe they do. In contrast, if the same people believed in the inferiority of the rest of the world, its people and its cultures, they would not spend so much time trying to prove their point. 
Inferior things normally fall into an inferior position and usually stay there without any help from anybody. All the European laws, lies, manipulation, or religion have not kept most of the non-European world in the inferior position the European world have assigned to it. Throughout their history, which is short in comparison to the history of other peoples, especially the Africans and the Asians, they have been astute record keepers. When it suited their purpose, they have also been astute record changers. As a result, the Europeans have caused us to read the history of the world in their favor. This book has provoked some non-Europeans into taking a new view of world history in order to understand how European people related to non-Europeans throughout history. The first thing we learned is that there was no Europe in ancient times. The geographical area that would later be called Europe was not a functioning entity in world affairs when early civilizations were being developed in the Nile Valley and other river valleys in Africa and later in Western Asia, now mistakenly called the Middle East, and in mainland Asia in countries like India, China, and later Japan. When we look at the chronology of world history, we discover that the first real show of European literary intelligence surfaced around 1250 BC, depending on your source, with the publication of two books of folklore, the Odyssey and the Iliad, credited to an author named Homer, who we have little information about. In the book, A History of the Modern World by R. R. Palmer and Joel Colton, they tell us that the Europeans were by no means the pioneers of human civilization. Half of man's recorded history had passed before anyone in Europe could read or write. The priests of Egypt began to keep written records between 4000 and 3000 BC. But more than 2000 years later, the poems of Homer were still being circulated in the Greek city-states by word of mouth. Shortly before 3000 BC, while the pharaohs were building the first pyramids, Europeans were creating nothing more distinguished than huge garbage heaps. Ironically, like the pyramids, they still endure and are known to archaeologists as kitchen middens. At the time when the Babylonian king Hammurabi, about 2000 BC, caused the laws of a complex society to be carved on stone, the most advanced Europeans were people like the Swiss lake dwellers, simple agriculturists who lived in shelters built over the water to protect themselves from beasts and men. In a word, until after 2000 BC, Europe was in the Neolithic or New Stone Age. This was in truth a great age in man's history the age in which men learn to make and use sharp tools, weave cloth, build living quarters, domesticate animals, plant seeds, harvest crops, and sense the returning cycles of the months and years. But the Near East, Egypt, the Euphrates and Tigris Valley, the island of Crete, and the shores of the Aegean Sea, which belonged more to Asia than to Europe, had reached and passed the Neolithic 2,000 years before Europe. Now I want to add on a personal note that even some of that information, some of the things that they credit to the Neolithic age in Europe are, are not true. They did not domesticate animals. And if they did, then why did the Moors have to teach them thousands of years later to domesticate animals that they couldn't sleep and live with chickens and goats? You know, just just a thought. But anyway, let's continue. We're going back now to the words of our beloved Dr. Clark. When Europeans finally got themselves together and created the semblance of what could be referred to as a state or a nation, they soon made a glaring discovery. Europe could not furnish them with enough food to properly feed them or enough material to properly clothe them they began to look with covetous eyes at the more developed parts of the world. Soon they would find a rationale for their initial military aggression under the young Macedonian Greek known in history as Alexander. He would invade North Africa in the year 332 BC. Following the invasions from Western Asia by the Assyrians in 666 BC and the Iranians 550 BC. 
these now guys remember remember those numbers these invaders and their ruthless administrations would cause the Africans of North Africa and the Nile Valley to cry out in effect oh God if you cannot send us a liberator send us a conqueror who would show us who would show some mercy Alexander did show some mercy he also showed that he was a greater diplomat than he was a warrior as a conqueror he did what conquerors do he raided the granaries of Egypt to feed his soldiers and his armies continued the bastardization of Egypt that was started by the Western Asian invasion of 1675 BC whose forced cohabitation with the women changed the population and the cultural temperature of the declining Nile Valley civilization. Alexander's and the Greeks conduct in Africa was more arrogant than racist. Some of the racism that we know today did have its genesis in the Greco-Roman period, although this racism can in no way be compared with, with what non-Europeans have experienced at the hands of Europeans for the last 500 years. So that means that the racism back then under Alexander was better than it is now? My goodness. With the military rise of Rome and the decline of Greek military power after Alexander, the Romans were determined to control the trade of the Mediterranean and had no intentions of sharing this trade with the Carthaginians who had built one of the most advanced commercial cities of the world of that day. The Roman conquest of a large area of North Africa and the consolidation of that conquest with the death of Hannibal and the end of the Punic Wars would install the Romans as the dominant power in the Mediterranean for the next 500 years. Because of the stubborn refusal of white scholars to read books like Stolen Legacy by George G.M. James published in 1954, African Origins of the Major West Religions by Dr. Joseph A. A. Ben Yakinen published in 1970, the destruction of black civilization, great issues of a race from 4500 BC to 2000 AD by Chancellor Williams published in 1974, Ages of Gold and Silver by John A. Jackson published in 1991. White scholarly pretenders who are often authorities on things they know little or nothing about are not aware of the early European intellectual dependency on North Africa and Western Asia. They are also not aware that most of the so-called Greek philosophers not only studied in Egypt, but consulted Egyptian texts on a regular basis. According to Theophilo Benga and his work, The Pharaonic Origins of Greek Philosophy, published in 1990. The word philosophy is not of Greek origin. This European practice of attributing the achievements of other people to themselves started during the Greco-Roman period and continues to this day. The racism that plagues us today had its origins in the second rise of Europe in the 15th and 16th centuries. During this period that the Europeans refer to as their Middle Ages or Dark Ages, Europe had lost their previous skills in seafaring and the concept of longitude and latitude had been also lost from their memory. They came out of this period in history, according to Professor Leonard Jeffries of City College of New York, land poor, people poor, and resource poor. The European established the slave trade and used it to begin its economical recovery. After the Crusades and the famines and plagues that arrested the attention of Europe for over 300 years, Europe's self-concept was damaged. Since 711, the year of the African Arab conquest of Spain, Europe had been held at bay by what they referred to as the hated infidels, African and Arab armies in North Africa and in the Mediterranean area, and by the continuous rise of Islam. Europe began to break out of this bind in the 1400s with the port assault on the city of Creta in Morocco in 1415, and again in 1455, when in settling an argument between Portugal and Spain, the Pope authorized Portugal and Spain to reduce to servitude all infidel people. Most of the declared infidels were Africans and Asians. This was the official rationale for the Atlantic slave trade. During this period, Europeans not only began to colonize most of the world, they also colonized information about the world. They colonized the Bible. They colonized all complementary images that non-European people held of themselves. 
the most effective of all of these colonized images was their colonization of the image of God. Through missionaries, adventurers, freebooters, and slave traders, they began to propagate the concept that God favored them over other people. They were saying in essence that all Europeans were the chosen people of God. Often in their teaching about God, they ran into a contradiction. They taught of a God who was kind and loved mankind, who was no respecter of kith or kin. By pretending that God favored them over other people, they had made God into a bigot. They had made God ungodly. Most of the non-Europeans had misconceptions about the Europeans' relationship to Christianity then and have some of the same misconceptions now. Europeans have a tendency of proclaiming ideas to the world that they do not believe themselves and would not dare to live by if they are going to hold power over most of the people of the world. The war on non-European culture that had been going on before the emergence of Europe now continued, mainly under European control. The Europeans were now telling their victims that the world waited in darkness for them to bring the light. Where in actuality, everywhere the European went outside of Europe, he put out the light of his victim's culture, spirituality, and cultured way of life. Not only did he not understand their culture, he had no intention of understanding their culture. Europeans declared war on the structure of every society they invaded or were welcomed into as visitors. Many societies that the European pretended to civilize would have been better off had the Europeans left them alone. In Africa, the Pacific Islands, and in large areas of mainland Asia, people had built safe and spiritual endowed societies before the first European war shoe or lived in a house that had a window. In large areas of Africa, a cluster of civilizations were built without an organized jail system or a word in their language which meant jail because there was no need in their society for one. There is a need to look at European racism in the opening up of the so-called New World. The best of the early recorded accounts come from Father Bartholomew de las Casas, who came to America on the third voyage of Christopher Columbus. When Christopher Columbus noticed the rapid disappearance of the Native American over the time of his three visits, he would go to de las Casas and request that he petition the Vatican for an increase in the Atlantic slave trade with the pretense that this increase would save the souls of the Native Americans. De Las Casas is considered the first historian of the New World. His account of mass murder and the disappearance of the natives of the New World, mistakenly called Indians, is entitled The Devastation of the Indies, a brief account was published in 1974. Father de las Casas's account of the island of Hispaniola, or Haiti, and the people he observed there is as follows. All the land so far discovered is a beehive of people. It is as though God had crowded into these islands the great majority of mankind. And of all the infinite universe of humanity, these people are the most guileless the most devoid of wickedness and duplicity, the most obedient and faithful to their native masters and to the Spanish Christians whom they serve. They are by nature the most humble, patient, and peaceable, holding no grudges, free from embroilments, neither excitable nor quarrelsome. These people are the most devoid of rancors, hatreds, or desire for vengeance, of any people in the world. And because they are so weak and complacent, they are less able to endure heavy labor and soon die of no matter what malady. The sons of nobles among us, brought up in the enjoyments of life's refinements, are no more delicate than these Indians. Even those among them who are of the lowest rank of laborers they are also poor people, for they not only possess little, but have no desire to possess worldly goods. For this reason, they are not arrogant, embittered, or greedy. If Father de la Casas' account of the people of Hispaniola is true, and I believe it is, 
What excuse can the Spanish Christians offer for their wholesale torture and murder? De Las Casas goes into a detailed description of the continuous annihilation of the Indians and the occupation and destruction of the civilizations of Mexico. Further, in his book, he describes the occupation of the Indies in this manner. To be continued.